Welcome to the Movie Geeks United 30th Anniversary Celebration of Fatal Attraction. Director Adrian Lyons' culture-defining thriller starring Michael Douglas, Glenn Close, and Anne Archer. In this episode, the film's screenwriter, James Dearden, chats with Arenada Diaz from our sibling show, Back by Midnight. This is an archived conversation from Back by Midnight, which was initially conducted in 2009. We're airing it for the first time. I'm also joined by one of the film's co-stars, actor Stuart Pankin, who portrays Michael Douglas's closest friend in the film. We begin with Mr. Dearden, followed by our brand new conversation with actor Stuart Pankin. Um, well, my father was quite a well-known um, British film director. Right. So I grew up with that very much in my life and never conceived of, that I would do anything different in any other business. So I guess, obviously, that was the, the main influence. So you knew early on that you wanted to be a screenwriter? Did you know what kind of stories you wanted to tell? Uh, not specifically. I mean, I wanted to be a director and a screenwriter. I always <laughs> wrote in order to make movies. And uh, when I was starting out, obviously, I wasn't getting sent anything. I was an unknown quantity. And the way to get um, a movie made was to obviously to, to write something that people wanted to see. And then you could sort of say, OK, but the condition is I direct it. I think I was always drawn. I always loved American film noir. Mm -hmm. I think I grew up seeing all those great black and white 40s movies by directors like Billy Wilder and Fritz Lang. And in a sense, Fatal Attraction is a, is a, is a sort of classic film noir in the sense of, you know, there's, there's a flawed hero who gets um, sucked into a nightmare. The thing about film noirs, you know, film noirs were always, you know, back in the 40s and, and early 50s, they had this constant sexual tension in them and they couldn't, uh, but, you know, they could only go so far without getting explicit and Fatal Attraction kind of, I guess uh, you could say was the natural progression. Uh, yeah, I think that's that. true. And I, I wasn't conscious about it when I was writing the screenplay, but looking at it now, I mean, Ben Close does conform to a lot of the characteristics of, of the 40s femme fatale, film noir, temptress, seductress, undoer of the hero, like Barbara Stanek in Double Indemnity. Well, uh, well, to get into that, what was the, the origin of, of the story? And how far, how far back does it predate when the film was made? Well, I made a short film which was 40 minutes long mm -hmm. in England in, the, in 1979, which was essentially the first third of the movie that, that you are familiar with. So it ended after the first weekend and basically ended with a phone ringing and <clears throat> the audience knew that the, it was the other woman calling to confront the wife and tell her what's been going on. So it was like a condensed version of, of, the, of, the, of the American full-length feature. Mm -hmm. And in that... And, and well, so let's let's start there. And what, where did this the 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 this idea of this weekend tryst that at seems to be grounded in you know you're an adult, I'm an adult, we're just having a weekend together, but then it seems to have a this potential blowback. And obviously in the short you end with the potential of that blowback. Uh, where did the the, the seed of that come from? This story. Well, I think it's every, I mean, I guess it's every man's nightmare that, that mm -hmm. he might, let's say, stray from the path and, and have a one-night stand. And most of the time, it's sort of consenting adults and people understand the rules of the game and it's nothing, you know, it's, it's, it's done and it's forgotten and it's, it doesn't come back to haunt you. Mm -hmm. And I was just thinking, well, what if it, it, there's a situation in which either partner, but in this case the woman decides that she doesn't want to play by the rules, that she wants more and thought she was entitled to more and in fact feels that she's been badly let down. And I just took it to each time to the next stage of, of not exactly harassment, but her just being awkward and difficult. And, and then obviously it gets a lot more serious when she reveals she's pregnant and then a lot more serious again when she reveals She's going to have the baby, and then a lot more serious again when she shows up at his apartment 
And each time it was like coming to a fork in the road and saying, what if we go down the worst fork possible instead of the fork that gets you out of this predicament? And so it kept getting more and more extreme so it ended up with what we have in the movie and bunny boiling and turning up with, you know, to, to, to murder his wife. I mean, it takes it to, to an extreme. Right. But each step is sort of logical. But before we get to that, so you do the short, and, it, and the short was self-contained, and it ended with this phone ringing, and so and that was its own entity. So at what point did you, like, you know, what point did you say to yourself, well, I want to extend this, or did someone tell you, maybe you should go... Well, uh, yeah, somebody, um, Stanley Jaffe, in fact, was in London, and I was, I was doing my first full-length feature for HBO, and he was meeting... English filmmakers, and I went to see him at his hotel, and I told him about the short film, because I, ha I hadn't got a cut that I was prepared to show him from, from the film I was doing for HBO, and I did have this finished short, and I sent it to him, and I thought probably wouldn't hear anything back, and to my surprise, a, a few days later, he and his partner, Sherry Lansing, called me really excited about the short film, and initially I wasn't like, well, what, you know, I didn't see what I could do that I hadn't done with the short. And it was really them that persuaded me that I could set it in New York and, and extend it and go much further. So I was obviously, as a young first time director, flattered to get a studio interested in, in, in my little short film. They tell you, you know, we want to do this a little further. And so then you sat down and you said, well, I won't, obviously, I can't end as the short ends with the phone ringing. I'll, I'll just go to one step further on each progression as you said earlier worst fork in the road and so uh, at, at, did you was it always a uh, in in your mind the intent to divide the audience's sympathy that this progression went well i think um inevitably that the audience you know sympathizes or empathizes with with the man in the sense that dan gallagher character, the Michael Douglas character, mm -hmm. because you see everything through his eyes, and he's the protagonist, even if you don't necessarily approve of everything he does. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, what sort of changed in the progression from the short film to the feature was that the Glenn Close character became much more menacing. In the, in mm -hmm. the short film, she's really quite sympathetic, and you, you see her point of view. I mean, she's obviously alone and she's had a lot of bad experiences with men and you know she's she's kind of on the edge of of the rope of the and she's she, this just tips this it's like she's teetering over the precipice and this is just one affair too many that goes wrong that sends her over you know into you know uh desperation because in the short film she does actually cut her wrists although it's it's really a theatrical gesture, but it's you know it's pretty frightening for the guy. Right. But you 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 are left with someone that is a little bit crazy, a little mm -hmm. bit unhinged, but equally is also a sad figure that you mm -hmm. you feel sorry for. And I don't think many audiences ended up feeling particularly sorry for Glenn Close. Right. Uh, well, I'll, I, I guess I'll ask about the most uh, famous thing, this bunny boiling scene, which is which wound up creating this phrase and into the lexicon, this bunny boiler. Uh, yeah. Where did that come from, that, the origin of that, 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 that step, that progression into the, into the terror, the escalation? Well, I, you know, I was just, I had to keep coming up with more awful things that she did. So the first thing she does after showing up at his apartment is to trash his car and mm -hmm. pour sulfuric acid all over it. And then obviously... The next thing is, well, what can you do after that? Well, you know, doing something horrible to a live creature, a pet, the child's pet, is 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 pretty te devastating. So that's it. Just came from again the ratcheting up of the pressure, mm -hmm. and obviously you go from that into taking the child to the fun fair. Right. But 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 the thing about that was that, in fact, she didn't have any ill intent towards the child. I don't think. I mean. It's, in a way, it's kind of difficult to say whether she did or didn't, because at a certain point, the character takes on a life of her own. And right. But but I always felt that she, it was a demonstration of firepower. She was saying to him, "Look, this is what I could do. 
-hmm. but it wasn't actually her intention ever to harm the child. Well, and, um, and so, you know, you, you've written the script, you finish the script, and so and you turn it into Stanley Goffey and Sherry Lansing, and obviously they must love it and it gets sent out. So what's it like? I, I know there was a, another director attacked uh, before Adrian Lyne, but what was it like when when someone like Adrian Lyne comes in who is not afraid to go into kind of dark places with female sexuality? What was that like for for you to, like, well, I, I, Adrian's, a, you know, also English, so we, we kind of had a natural affinity. I mean, I was actually originally going to direct it. Then, mm -hmm. I mean, I've read on IMDb that all kinds of directors that I didn't even know were going to direct it came on board. But I, I certainly worked with Brian De Palma on a whole draft that never saw the light of day because he really was attached to the project. And was, so uh, it was, just, it, just, just out of curiosity, was that draft... Uh, you know, drastically different from... Yes. It was terrible. <laughs> oh, really? Sherry refused to read it. I mean, it ended up with um, the Glenn Close character on Halloween running around in a kabuki mask with a long knife terrorizing everybody. It was insane. It was I, more, think, I guess it was more of a horror film. Yeah. Brian sort of took it into much more of a genre direction. Mm -hmm. So it was a relief when Adrian came on board because he, he liked the draft that predated that, which was you know pretty much close to the finished movie. Mm -hmm. And Adrian, I, I got to assume that at the, uh, when Mr. Lyne came on, he must have had a sort of uh, a little more try to cr inject a little more empathy for the female character. Definitely. We were actually both um, shocked at, 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 at one of the test screenings at, at, at the... At the Mm -hmm. the way the audience reacted to the Glenn Close character. I mean, they, they obviously hated her, mm -hmm. and that really hadn't been our intention. I suppose a lot of it came from the fact that she threatened the family, and the family is, is like a, a, you know, an American institu well, it's a, an institution everywhere, but it's particularly an American institution in movies. I mean, it's, it's the, the sacred place where you don't, you know, mm -hmm. you don't make a mess. You don't come in and destroy. It's it, everybody... And I think they, it wasn't so much they sympathized with Michael Douglas, but they sympathized with the wife and the child and the family unit. Mm -hmm. And even if he'd been a bad boy, they still didn't want to see the family broken up or mm -hmm. destroyed in any way. So she, then Close then becomes the, 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 the threatening fury that's going to, you know, destroy this, this sweet right. family. And that's why I think in the end they wanted her killed. And when and uh, before we get to the ending, I do want to talk about the ending. But let's talk a little bit about the cast. And, and I got to imagine. I mean, that must have been uh, kind of the, the, one of those the trickiest role to cast was Glenn Close, and that you wanted someone uh, sexual, but probably not overtly sexual, but had uh, this kind of you know sexuality, but who was also aware that. You know, time was passing. What was that like when, when when they finally cast Glenn Close for that role? Was that was that different than what I guess you all had envisioned? But when you saw her, it really clicked. Or how did that? Yeah, happen? I mean, it's it's always you know, I, I I always had an image of the character in my head that wasn't necessarily Glenn Close. I mean, Glenn Close in my you know the movies I'd seen before was was much softer, and mm -hmm. you couldn't really imagine her necessarily as this character. But she is an amazing actress, and I think that's. You know, really, what became apparent is that it, she may not have been the obvious choice, but once she came in, it, it was hard to think of anybody else doing it because she she understood all the nuances of the character, and she could also she could she could I think she could play the sympathy certainly at the beginning before the character becomes totally crazed, and and I think you did feel sorry for her, mm -hmm. and then when the, when she turns, you can also believe the psychotic aspect of the character. Right. And, and I'm curious, from being a Britisher, was it a culture shock or is it kind of amusing at these test screenings of kind of the way the, uh, no matter how bad kind of the male patriarchal figure behaves, that American audiences were more or less seen to be on his side no matter what? To a certain extent, is that yeah? It, 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 I won't say it was shocking, but it was it was revealing. I mean, it, I think audiences, but I mean, it wasn't just in the states. It was that most audiences in the world had a similar reaction, and I mean, that's what you really learn is that in the end, 
it is a global audience, and they all kind of do respond in a more or less similar way. The only place where they didn't respond the same was in France, because the French have traditions of, of having mistresses and really couldn't understand what all the fuss was about. <laughs> but, but certainly the reaction from the English audience was, was pretty much the same. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think um, I think we were just surprised at, at, at how much, because ironically part of the problem trying to get the movie made with studios was they all said, we don't want to make this movie because who's going to root for such an unsympathetic central character? They couldn't really see that the audience would ever forgive Michael Douglas for cheating on his wife. Mm -hmm. So... I, I've always and that was in a way why why the ending that was reshot it was the wife that blows away the Glenn Close character because Michael was in a way too tainted mm -hmm. for the audience to accept him doing it. And before we get to that ending, one aspect I, I always found it fascinating when at the time when the movie came out and, and even now when people talk about the film is that you know how much they are willing to for, to kind of overlook some of his bad behavior. I mean, I, I mean, he is at one point he's told that this woman is carrying his unborn child, and he really doesn't uh, he really doesn't bat an eye about that. Uh, no, I mean he's he's a very reprehensible character in many ways. But I mean, I also think it's it's you know when somebody's trying to keep something you know secret and doesn't want it to come out and ruin his life. I mean, I think people can be pretty ruthless right. and, and and I think you know rightly or wrongly a lot of men in that situation would probably say look can't you get rid of the baby you know can't you get rid of it mm -hmm. that's the first reaction I mean he certainly doesn't want to raise a second family or he yeah. certainly doesn't want his wife to find out what he's been up to so yes it's it's reprehensible but at the same time it's I think it's understandable and so, uh, so let's get to the, those test screenings with you know with the original ending. And, and for our listeners, it, it's on the Blu-ray. Uh, the original ending uh, was, I guess you could say, was the logical ending of the story. In that Glenn Close uh, character uh, kills herself. Yeah, uh, and uh, but what was slightly missed from the ending that was, the original ending that was shot was originally in the screenplay. Mm -hmm. It would, you wouldn't have seen Glenn Close killing herself in the bathroom, which is what you see. You would have seen Madame Butterfly killing herself in the opera. Mm -hmm. Because in the scene where Glenn Close is switching the lamp on and off, mm -hmm. when, when she's got the sort of unused tickets, in my original draft, she actually went to the, to the Met to see the opera and sat next to an empty seat. So at that point, you would have seen Madame Butterfly on stage killing herself, committing harakiri at the end mm -hmm. when she's abandoned. And therefore, when it was reprised at the end of the movie, you would have understood what it was about. You would have had your kind of, you know, education of Madame Butterfly if you hadn't seen the opera, which most right. of the audience wouldn't have. But it, I mean, it might have been too subtle. It might have gone straight over the audience's head. I don't know. But... So the audience, Adrian, actually the truth is the budget, they went so over budget that they couldn't shoot that opera scene, which was going to be quite a big production number. And um, so Adrian shot in the bathroom, which I still thought was effective, but it was a little bit, I think it was too brutal to see. And I think audiences partly reacted against that for that reason. And so they reacted to that. And also, you know, at that time, audiences, they really... As, um, as you said, you were surprised that they really were on Douglas's side, and they really wanted this outside force that was threatening the fan family to be truly banished, uh, and not only banished, but banished by the wife, the mother. Yeah. And so, when you when you know after the test screens and you get and you get the cards back or the report back, like look, they love the film up until the ending. We're going to. Pull, pull the trigger and reshoot the ending. It, I, I got to assume there must have been some uh, very passionate discussion. A lot of resistance, yeah. Um, especially, um, well, Adrian was, you know, horrified because mm -hmm. up till the screenings, you know, Paramount had been very gung ho about the movie and, and, and nobody had, you know, mentioned a need to change the ending. But And it was quite early in, in these test screenings. I don't think there'd been many up to that point, certainly that had 
completely changed the, the, the trajectory of a movie. Mm -hmm. uh, it almost began with Fatal Attraction because it was obviously successful because the film became a monster hit. Mm -hmm. And the screenings were indicated, you know, a fairly modest uh, box office take. And, and suddenly we went from, you know, maybe 30 or 40 million, if we were lucky, to three or 400 worldwide. So <laughs> it vindicated the system, much as, as filmmakers, we resisted it and were reluctant to go along the path that we were being directed down. Uh, one has to admit, in retrospect, that Certainly, from a commercial point of view, it, it, it was it was right. Uh, whether it was right from an artistic point of view is a different conversation. Right, and 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 obviously, when you had when you first started the story, you know, almost a decade earlier in the late seventies, I mean, um, you know, age was non-existent, and so when Fred no, exactly, and and there were far, you know, when people started talking about the film as a parable parable about AIDS and that Glenn Close somehow was the virus and. I mean, I was just, you know, astonished. I mean, I just thought this is insanity. It wasn't even subconsciously in my mind. Right. It it was, um, you know, it's a very old story. It's it's you, it's it's that's I think what the secret of the appeal of the movie is. It's in a way, it's one of the oldest stories in the world. I mean, it's it's probably in the Bible. I mean, there are stories of infidelity in the Bible. Every husband, you know, thinks about cheating on his wife, even if he doesn't, every wife worries that her husband might be cheating on her, and every every ma in every mistress feels lonely and rejected and wants to get the husband. I, it's, I think that's why people could empathize with all the characters. And that, that period, that fall of 87 all the way through the Oscars, even though you, you know, artistically you and Adrian Lyon and even Glenn Close probably were you know, y'all were resistant to this ending, this crowd-pleasing ending that y'all had to do, and then the movie comes out, and as you said, the system gets vindicated, and it just takes off. Uh, at the time, were you able to understand that you were, quote-unquote, in a moment, or were you too much in it to realize that it was, there, you know, you, would, you were actually inadvertently a part of something that was, you know, that hit the zeitgeist? Well, I was away in Greece shooting my own movie when it came out, so I, it, it wasn't until it opened in, in England, which mm -hmm. was at the beginning of uh, 88, sort of probably three or four months after the U.S. opening, that I realized that it really was more than just a movie, because I was, like, interviewed on the national news, and, you know, it was also previously on the cover of Newsweek and um, Time, Time I magazine. I think it was on the cover of both. It was certainly on the cover of People magazine as well. Yeah. Um, and it was a bit weird, yeah. I was on, on talk shows with people like Cher Height who were attacking the movie, and I was kind of defending it, but I was being, like, accused of anti-feminism and God knows <laughs> what. And, 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 what it, and, and what do you remember of the uh, the nomination, the, the Oscar nominee? What was that like for you? Well, that was very exciting. Obviously, it was exciting. I got a call from Sherry Lansing saying, guess what, we've been nominated in, I think it was six categories. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I went to the Oscars, and that was also pretty amazing because there were all these Glenn Close lookalikes that kind of, in along the red carpet, there were like 50 Glenn Closes cheering and yelling when we passed through, and you kind of spend a few minutes talking to the TV host, and the buzz was, I mean, just the heat, you felt the heat coming off, the, you know, the people, the people watching. It just felt like being on an enormous stage. Well, I think it always feels a bit like that at the Oscars, but it, it, there was sort of a kind of rush about faith attraction at that time. Not only that, and then combining that, I mean, that was that was Michael Douglas's year with that big hit. I mean, that fueled whatever audience interest for yeah. Wall Street. Which I mean, the annoying thing is, if he hadn't been in Wall Street, he probably would have won it for faith attraction, but mm. um, he won it for Wall Street. Mm -hmm. And we were also up against the kind of juggernaut of Last Emperor, which won in every category, and so right. in, in the end, we got a lot of nominations, but none of them came through. But mm -hmm. still, can't complain. So, so I, I guess to start yeah. out with, I have enjoyed your work immensely over the years. Um, Thank you. And so I'm, I'm very excited to speak with you, but I'm curious about prior to Fatal Attraction, I mean, I know some of the highlights of your career in film and television prior to that point, but if you could give me a, a little bit of a trajectory of that career prior to that film, D did you start in 
in theater? Is that where it started for you? Oh yeah, I I started in uh, I started in theater. I got interested in theater, and well, I guess I've always been a kind of performer, even as a kid, <clears throat> messing around performing for my family. But in college, uh, uh, I signed up to be a psychology major in college, and but. I knew when they auditioned for the first play, walking across a dark, lonely campus to audition, I knew, I think, I said, this is this is what I want to do. And then I had a f- fabulous teacher, a friend, Dave Brubaker, who was head of the drama department in, uh, at Dickinson College, and uh, that was it. I mean, I was I was hooked. I mean, the, f- you <laughs> the funny thing is, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, please, finish. We never, in my years, we didn't even have a drama major at Dickinson, so we had four classes. I took three because he said I didn't have to take the acting class, and uh, and that was it. I just fell in love with it and, and did that. And then I went so to... See, uh, you, uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but do you see any no. kind of uh, correlation between your ambitions to be a performer and what you initially were going to get into, which was, did you say it was psych- Psychology. psychology? Well, yeah. I kind of was interested in psychology from from, from high school. I, I enjoyed it. I'm, I'm terrible at math, and um, but psychology looked interesting. Uh, I actually ended up being an English major in, in college, which is some of my friends in college and some of the seniors said that's a very good major for a drama uh, guy, English, because you know you read the plays, you read literature. But I don't think there's a lot of correlation between. My wanting to be a psychologist and and acting, although I think that if you're if you're not bad at the, at, at acting, there is an element of psychology. You gotta you gotta understand people, you know, on the on the page and even on the stage when you're working with them. But I don't think I never really thought about there being a direct correlation between psychology and acting. But you you know my my, my awareness of you, I was born in '73, so my consciousness of of uh, entertainment and film and television really uh, came to fruition in the 80s. So m- my first memory of you is uh, not necessarily the news, uh, uh, which was a show I was absolutely crazy about, uh, even at a young too. age. And you know what? I don't, I don't think that show gets the credit it deserves because now we see the trend of, uh, of, a, of a humorous delivery of news all over the place. But back right. then it was very rare. I mean, it was a trend-setting show, I think. Well, uh, that's very very kind. The people who who talk to me about not necessary news say kind of what you said that uh, that not the news was. I mean, it wasn't the first time. I mean, I mean, there have been other news parody shows before that, but not the news. They say, oh, you guys started, uh, you know, Colbert and 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 John whatever his name is, you know, and you you and and that's very nice. <clears throat> Although not the, not the, not necessarily the news came from not the nine o'clock news in England. You know, and there have been, who's that guy, David, somebody, David Frost, had a, that was the week that was a uh, news parody show. So there had been others, but it's always gratifying when people come up and, and talk so kindly about not necessarily the news um, as being some sort of groundbreaker. Whether it is or not, at least it entertained people, and that that's that's the best. Well, it's been, you know, more than 35 years, and I, I still have very fond remembrances of it. Well, uh, I mean, I, I can remember, and those were the early days of HBO too, weren't they? Right. I mean, it was. You should forgive the expression. Cable in in those days had twenty nine percent penetration, uh, as they say, in the uh, <laughs> in, in the market, uh, and that's that was regular cable. I mean, when you're dealing with pay cable, you had even less. Uh, uh, people signing up for HBO and, and the premium uh, services. So for people to <clears throat> still remember and like that show, it it, it makes us all, everybody in the, in the show, feel real good. Mm. So you're when you where did you come from um, when, before you moved to LA? Um, New York, New York. I was okay. I was born and raised in Philadelphia, a little Massachusetts, but I was in New York. I got a, a master's degree from uh, Columbia. Uh, which is where I met my wife, which was a good thing. And uh, I auditioned for a show called The San Pedro Beach Bums, which is Aaron Spelling's first and last attempt at hour-long comedy. And I got it, and I moved to to California to do that show. And 
when that show ended after about 10 episodes we just decided to start i actually got a, a development deal with universal which didn't go very didn't go very far but it kept me in town and i'm i'm glad it did i mean the the old <laughs> the old story is when you're in new york how do i get to how do i get to california well that that you know that uh was the was the way and it was a great it was a great boon of course now when you've been in california for you know 30 years you say how do i get back to new york how can i get back to the theater <laughs> yeah but you were really uh, i mean between not necessarily the news and some of the early film work that you did you seem to have been building a persona or an identity as a comic actor and and fatal attraction is a stark contrast to that uh what, so was that a conscious effort to to do something outside of the world of, of comedy for you? Well, no. I mean, excuse me. I am um, on stage, which is where I did a lot of the stuff. I, I played any number of dramatic parts. It's when when you come up and you were, a, you know, a heavy, funny guy, you, you get the you get the comedy parts. The interesting thing is that with Fatal Attraction, <clears throat> it wasn't any conscious effort on my part. I was called to, to audition, and I. And I did it, and later I realized, I mean, Adrian said, Adrian Lyon, the director, said uh, they wanted somebody with with a, 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 a funny comedy persona, somebody that people could, it, it, they could lighten the load of the movie. So in a funny way, I was cast because I was you know, known to do comedy. Um, and for that, of course, we'll discuss more of that later, but uh, I'm always grateful for that because he fought for me. We can talk about that whenever. So, so did, did it come from your agent this audition opportunity? For I, I, it probably did. It probably did. I, I just, I don't remember. Uh, it was thirty years ago, it was before you were born. Yeah. Well, you're. Uh, but when you when you did audition, was it was it for Mr. Line? Yeah. Um, it, it had to be. It it had to be. I remember actually sitting in a room. And reading the script, and he was there. Maybe he might have been the only one there. I don't know. Maybe the casting people were there. And did, doing the scene, and then he said, "Well, put the script down, and let's just let's just do a little improvisation about it." And we did that. And I don't, I have no idea what I said or what it was about, but I do remember him saying, "Get off the script, and uh, and let's just play with the scene, and blah blah blah." And and that was it. And a big part of what makes your your performance work is that there's a. There's a comfort level between yourself and Michael Douglas uh, because you guys essentially play best buddies in, right. in, in the film. Was that was that very easy to establish right away with him that rapport? Yeah, pretty much. It was very clever. Uh, Adrian said, Michael and Ann Archer and uh, me and my wife, uh, and she'll kill me because I just don't remember her name, but you do. Um, uh, um, they said, go out to lunch. Go. The you actress played. that played your wife in the movie? Yeah. yeah. Um, Come on, man. I'm going to be in it. big, big trouble. <laughs> anyway. Because she's wonderful. You know, she's a, I Ellen think she's Ellen, Ellen, Ellen who? Foley. Foley. Ellen Foley. My God, we're Facebook friends and everything. You know, she's a singer now. She's she's doing well. But uh, Adrian said, go out to lunch. And we did. We went out to lunch. We talked about each other. We, you know, we we joked. I don't remember what we ate or what we talked about. But it was a very clever way to, to, to get the four friends together. And he was so sweet and 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 and, and generous and giving. So it, it was easy to 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 be pals with him. I mean, he was, you know, he's. I, I don't know if he was a huge huge star at the time, but but uh, he was certainly bigger than me, and uh, he was very very generous and sweet to me. Did the script for Fatal Attraction did it did it read uh, provocative on the page? I mean, was it clear that this was a, a very uh, Kind of combustible material. You know, I, I I don't I don't remember approaching it or or uh, analyzing it in uh, in those terms. Uh, maybe I was just reading my part. You know, my part, my part, blah blah blah, my part, my part. But I it it didn't didn't seem to me to be that. And I think a lot of the oh you know interesting or or scenes and the way they filmed the scene was all adrian i mean you know things in the elevator and on the sink and all that stuff i don't know if that was in the script or if it came if it came during rehearsal i don't think anybody knew maybe he did you know that the fatal attraction would become as popular or, or iconic as it as it turned out to be i i, I really don't know 
I just, you know, I know that whatever success it has, it's, it's, it's Adrian. It's, you know, he, it was his vision and, uh, and he brought it off. Great. He is absolutely one of my favorite filmmakers and it's been so long since he's directed a film. I mean, the last one he did, um, unfaithful was, was equally just a magnificent movie, but I love him because his movies are, and this might sound like a strange comment, his movies feel very tactile to me. I mean, there are moments mm. in Fatal Attraction and something like Lolita, when she's drinking a milkshake in Lolita, I feel like mm. I can actually touch and taste that milkshake. I mean, it's a special kind of gift that he has. But at the but same no, time... No, no, you need help. You need help. It's so <laughs> I'm just too crazy about movies. But at the same time, he is so uh, insightful about character. Oh um, yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And I'm wondering how he how, how he directed you. Well, you know, I mean, this sounds like a cliche, but he he sort of left me alone, you know. And and any number of those, if you remember the dinner scene, a lot of that, not a lot, but um, a chunk of it was improvised. Um, I came up with stuff, and he says it. He's he's very kind to me in in a an interview that he had on a laser disc or something. Um, he said he wanted, you know, somebody to, to make it lighter. And he was, uh, he, and he let me do, and he let me say, and he kept it in uh, some of the improv- improvisations that, that, that we did and that I, I did alone or I did with Michael or I did with Ann, you know. So he kind of left me alone. Um, and to be honest with you, 30 years ago, if he did, you know, sh- give me notes or shape things. I, I don't remember. I, I, I just like to, you know, I like to pretend that, uh, that I came up with all the good stuff. <laughs> when you, when you saw them, I'm sure, I'm sure that you did, but, but what's interesting is, I mean, the way that your, your role in that film, it could have been done very, uh, gratuitously, because mm-hmm. I think a, a lesser filmmaker might come in and say, please make this, make this funny, you know, the, you, you're you're going to be the comic relief of the film, but right. what it actually is, it just makes the film feel that more comfortable and and lived in and relatable. Yeah, well, that's great. And like I say, I keep remembering the dinner scene, which is you know the, the one of the most fun days we had. It, it was so easy to 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 play with those people. I mean, just you know, just, also the fact that it, it was. We popped a bottle of champagne, you know, during the scene, and we did the scene any number of times. So we were popping a lot of champagne and drinking a lot of champagne. And all of us were getting a little buzzed. <laughs> maybe that helped. Maybe it didn't. But uh, no, it was um, it, it was really satisfying. And then when I saw the movie, I said, "Well, look, he's, you know, it's his movie, and, and it's either going to be in or be out." And when I saw that that it was in, and some of the reactions that we all did. He, 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 he kept them in. I, I, and I, you know, when you, when you're dealing with, well, television, maybe film, you know, you like to service the stars a lot, but Adrian, uh, felt, I hope that he would be servicing the movie by, you know, keeping, you know, certain reactions from, from the, from the, the other players in. And I, I admire that. I think that's, you know, I think a lot of people can learn from him to service the film more than just service the, the stars. Do you remember your reaction when you saw it for the first time? Uh, oh, I think I liked it a lot. Uh, he cut. Uh, we I had a scene in the library with Michael when I had a long when I had a fairly long speech, and um, and people still remember that scene, you know, and me in the scene. But there, it was a lot longer, and he cut it when I went in to do some voiceover, to, you know, for some ADR for the movie. Uh, he played that scene and it was gone. And I felt I felt bad, and we never talked about it. He never said anything. Uh, but that's the only that's the only thing that I reacted. And I saw that I saw the the cut before the movie. So when I saw the movie, I thought the movie was great. I thought you know I thought it was really great. And of course you know about the controversy about the ending and all that stuff. And that was kind of interesting yeah. too. Did you so so that scene? It's in a library when he's when he's confessing to you. That's that exactly scene right. initially was longer. Yeah, he said, "What can I do?" And I said, "Well, you know, it ain't easy." And I think that's that, then he then he cut. I'm giving him all kinds of legal things, and it was a you know it was a nice long paragraph about about stuff. And he decided he didn't need it, which is 
you know, that's his privilege, and, and uh, whatever he wants to do, he can do. Were you on the periphery of the discussions about the ending, or were you kind of out of it? Out, out oh, of the no, no, I was, I, I, I was finished. I, I wasn't, you know, I was doing not necessarily the news at the time, and um, <laughs> that's why I'm always grateful to, to, to Mr. Line. I mean, and I was in California, and he read and he said he wanted me and the producers apparently who I became friendly with later, uh, Stanley Jaffe and, uh, excuse me while I go take uh, Sherry, Lansing. Over to Sherry Lansing. Um, they said, get somebody in New York. I mean, and, and he said, God bless him. No, I want, I want Stuart Pankin. So I flew in once a week for a month uh, because I was shooting not necessarily the news at the time, to do my scene. Sometimes I stayed. I got in at night, sh- shot during the day, went back that same same night. Sometimes I spent a couple of days there. But it was a month flying back and forth to do Fatal Attraction. So I, I, and I certainly wasn't involved in the end uh, because I was long gone by then. Yeah. But, uh, but, you know, but, you know, go ahead. Yeah, I mean, the it's it's one of the most interesting stories from that decade of of film. Yeah, uh, and it. I guess it's an argument that still goes back and forth. I mean, I I I know that my uh, a lot of my film loving friends think that they needed to retain the original ending as as some kind of sign of integrity, but mm-hmm. um, at the same time, I, I think Fatal Attraction is what it is because, in a large part, because of that ending. Uh, yeah, I, I mean do. it's it's thrilling. You can't deny it. It satisfies something in, in an audience. It, it does. Well, you know, you know as well as I do. When they tested it, the the original ending was not great, and there was a lot of controversy among the cast and the writers. I think they brought in Nicholas Meyer, and they brought in the original writer to, to to tweak it and change it. And I don't think Anne wanted to do it in the beginning, and uh, and apparently there's there was a bunch of controversy and. Eventually, obviously, they 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 pick the uh, the bathtub ending, and uh, except for the fact that apparently Glenn had to go into the bathtub fifty times and got an ear infection, uh, it, I, I think you're right. I think it does. It's it's memorable. It's not an it's not a thousand percent new idea, but it was you know very well done, and people wanted that that woman dead. Yeah. <laughs> Which is a sign that the I mean the character really worked. They were they were so oh invested God. in that movie and its outcome. Uh, when were you first uh, aware of the cultural impact of the movie? Hmm. Well, I think soon after it came out, there was articles about oh God, guys are now afraid to 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 step out on their wives and and how. It made men scared to, to to even look twice at another woman. I mean, that that sort of stuff came out. As a matter of fact, apparently in England, if a woman is tough like Glenn Close's character, they call her a, a bunny boiler. So that's come Ooh. down. That's come down through, <laughs> through the lexicon. Wow. You know, I I, I've, I was thinking about other movies comparable to Fatal Attraction and. You know, every decade or so, maybe there's a film that comes around that says something about male-female relationships that strikes a chord. Mm-hmm. And I was thinking about something like Looking for Mr. Goodbar in the 70s, which was um, a cautionary tale about the the burgeoning single scene. Uh, and that was very effective in that respect. But Fatal Attraction came, and I don't know if you have any thoughts on this, but it, it, it came in the at the epicenter of the AIDS crisis. Uh and I'm wondering if you think that had anything to do with its resonance. Um, it very well might. Um, it, w- it was also, uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I don't know any st- statistics, but I also know that there were feminist, whatever that means, groups that, that disliked it because it made, you know, Glenn Close's character the way she was. And they really objected to that. Uh, and er- anytime something like that happens, you're like, oh, well, we don't like this movie because it, it shows this person like this, or it shows. It, you just want to say it's it's one movie. There are people like that out there, and and the filmmakers certainly have a right to do that, you know, to do that that story. Uh, but whether the whether being in, and I don't even know. I don't remember. It's been a while. If people were talking about AIDS, and was it even mentioned in the film? I don't think that 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 idea was was even touched on in the film, was it? 
No, it, not not explicitly in the film, not not at all. But yeah, you know, yeah. people people try to read cultural trends and things, and they and they come up with their own hypothesis. And you and I, I do remember AIDS was in the conversation because AIDS made uh, f- free sex with someone outside of marriage uh, a dangerous proposition. Right, um, and, and I course. think they read parallels there somehow. Yeah, I, I think you're right. I mean, I, I it makes sense. So it, it, you've done a lot of great work, um, it, whether it's you know arachnophobia or or the the show Dinosaurs or mm-hmm. Curb Your Enthusiasm, which I want to ask you about. Um, sure. Where does Fatal Attraction fall in, in in the pantheon of your career for you? Oh, way at the top. I mean, way up there, if not at the top. I mean, it was it was great to do. It turned out great. You know, it was a, how many? It was nominated for an Academy Award and for for the movie and for a, other, a bunch of other people and a bunch of other technical achievements. No, it's way up there. Yeah.